everybody. Welcome to episode 223. It is Saturday, November 13th, and I hope that this finds you really well. Uh, we've got gray overcast here. It's, it's cold this morning. I mean, it's still above zero, so really we can't complain, but say lovey. I just realized I forgot to turn on all my lights. I didn't turn on any lights. <laughs> I just sat down got everything ready, made sure the links were working. Thank you, Diane. And um, I just started podcasting. <laughs> so we're under like natural light today. Um, I'll turn on one of my big lights when I go to uh, the opening credits, but that's so funny. I feel really out of um, the routine this week, which is weird because we've had like, we haven't really missed any weekends recently, but this week has been truly insane. Um, it's just been kind of one thing after another. It's been like one of those weeks and it's not bad stuff. It was all really good stuff, but it was just like, you know, a science test and driving my mom to the ferry, which was totally fine, but it's three hours of driving for us. And like, it's just, you know what I mean? Like it's just stuff. Um, so welcome to the show. Weird that <laughs> This I'm out of my I'm out of my routine or out of my comfort. I don't know. Um, I hope that you guys are doing really well. Welcome to new viewers of the podcast. I hope that you enjoy this space and you find what you're looking for here and that you find a community here. Welcome to returning viewers. Thank you so much for continuing to watch the show week in week out here on the YouTube and or you can watch over at Patreon as well. And welcome to our Patreon subscribers. You guys are the ones that keep the lights on week after week, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for your um, support, your kindness, your grace to one another. That It just really makes my heart sing. Um, there is very, very busy stuff going on in chat today. Samantha had lost her flicker brush, but she, I think she found it. <laughs> um, she wondered if people in the chat knew where it was, so they were guessing and she was looking. Um, lots of people from experiencing foggy, fall-like weather, um, I, I think, you know, many of us are in the Northern Hemisphere, so we are sort of in that sort of late fall, um, I think they call it deep fall uh, season. Uh, Kelly says the lighting looked very cozy. Thank you, Kelly. That's really kind. Uh, Dana says, I love your shawl. Thank you so much, Dana. This is the Hyssop by Layla Raven. It's from her book uh, that she did on shawls. I usually don't buy knitting books, but that was one that I bought. And I, um, I've i knit this out of it, and I've got a couple other ones that are, that are earmarked. It's kind of an interesting uh, construction for those who haven't seen this shawl. You actually start from the bottom point, and you work your way up. So as you're going, you, dec you increase stitches um, so it's a little bit you know typical top-down shawls you're decreasing stitches so as your shawl gets smaller and it's a triangle you sort of have less and less stitches to work but with this it's the opposite so that's a little bit um, as you get as your rows get longer and longer it gets a little bit a little bit daunting it is in my Ravelry projects for those who are interested and um, I will throw that into live chat for, for those of you who uh, who are interested. So thank you so much. It is out of my hand spun. It's out of um, a 50-50 uh, Merino alpaca. And I'm not sensitive to this. And I dyed it with logwood. It was a sweater that I had pulled out. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. In today's show, I actually have a whole pile of yarn here to show you that I have finished and some reflections about some of it, some thoughts that I have. My cat belt cardigan is not finished yet, so we will talk about that. And uh, I'll tell you sort of what I'm struggling with with it. And it's just finishing stuff that I'm struggling with. So I'll show that to you. I was really hoping it would be done for today, but I can't do seaming at the pool. It, for whatever reason, sitting with on my lap, I, some people can seam with their sweaters and stuff on their laps, but I really like to seam on a on a hard surface. So I'm hoping to get that done later today. And then I have major progress on my Yastaba cardigan. So I thought that I would share that with you. So without further ado, let's get into the show.
so I was talking to Eve earlier this week and uh, she uh, just mentioned in the chat and reminded me, uh, I dug out my, my listening shawl uh, this today as she's sitting in a well-ventilated room at her first in-person guild meeting since February 2020, which is wonderful. So uh, almost, you know, almost a year, well, February 2021. It's going to be almost two years in February 2022, just a few more months. So yeah, that must feel really good, Eve. Um, you're, you're so welcome, Dana. Uh, Priscilla is here this week. That's so funny, Priscilla. I know. Uh, I, so I always wonder about this time. You know, if eight Pacific really works because we're behind everyone, right? So for all of you guys, it's quite a bit later. And I often wonder, especially for those in the UK where it's like right at dinner time on a Saturday, I often wonder like what the right time would be to podcast. Like, would it be 6.30 in the morning? Would it be eight o'clock? For those on of us who are on the Pacific um, sort of side, uh, who are in Pacific time, 8 a.m. on a or 6:30 a.m. on a Saturday morning doesn't really work for most of us. Although I have to admit, I am usually up and I am usually awake. You know, would it be better to do it late on a Friday night so that it hits people in the morning? I I just I don't know. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Please please let me know. Um. Yes. It we well and Priscilla, that's a really good point because um, at 8:30. Um, it was 8.30 for a while uh, because that's what worked for soccer. And then we had to roll it back because 8 is the time that James plays soccer now. So then I had to roll it back to 8 o'clock. So yeah, it is confusing sometimes when I have to move things around. So yeah, super understand that. So let's talk about my yarn uh, because otherwise what always ends up happening inevitably is we have super, super long shows and I start to lose my voice. <laughs> so let's do that and let me pull, when I was pulling on my shawl, my necklace went tight and it's strangling me. So let me fix that too. Okay, let's talk about yarn first. I'll move my Cat Bells cardigan out of the way and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes and I'll show you guys what, what I'm struggling with. So this is all of my finished yarn for this week. I can't believe I got it all done. So it was all plied, um, but it was all sitting on bobbins, which is kind of, sometimes it, I just find it really hard to get stuff off of my bobbins. Like I get it all plied and then it sort of sits on bobbins for a while. So let's talk about this first. I have spun this yarn before. I have talked about it quite a lot on the podcast. This was CVM, uh, from Colorado. It was a clear out. Um, and, um, me and my friend Greta shared two fleeces. So this was the one fleece and this is sort of a tawny brown color. The camera today is very warm. Um, we've got this sort of warm light rather than our regular light that sort of shows more true color. So this is showing up a little bit browner than it actually is. This is actually more of a, more of a tawny brown. I don't know if you can see it a bit better up here. It's still kind of showing a little, a little bit browner than it, than it normally is. I ended up using this for my spark cardigan by uh, Andrea Mowry. It was the background color. It was a three ply. It was spun woolen. I have actually worn that sweater quite a bit. I'm I'm quite surprised at how much I have worn it, and uh, just because it's it's unbelievably warm. And I had some bobbins left over from plying that were just the singles, and I hadn't sort of gotten going. The problem with um with this uh was that i didn't want to do another three ply yarn i'd sort of worked with the three ply for the spark cardigan and i decided to two ply it instead so i spun up the rest of the bag which i think i shared last weekend i told you guys about all of that and i sort of put that time deadline on myself because it was taking a little bit longer than i thought it was it was actually more fiber that was left in the bag than i thought and so I um, got, I finally got this all, all plied up. I still have a tiny little bit left to do that's on a storage bobbin because I have to move the singles around. I really don't like spinning, uh, plying from a center pull ball when it's a woolen spun yarn. I find it gets really tangled. It gets really, really, um, you know, you end up with knots and twists, even if it's been resting for a while, I would rather just redistribute those singles and move them around a little bit. So if you are thinking about plying from a center pole ball and it's woolen spun, just be warned. Uh, it can be really, really challenging. So I ended up two plying all of this and pre washing. I'm not sure what I lost in the washing. I've ended up with about 900 yards 
pre-washing. So hopefully when this is all said and done, I'll end up with about a thousand yards because I have about probably 100 or 150 yards, maybe 200 yards left still to be plied. And I have another skein of this yarn that's a two ply. So in the end, I probably will have between 1300 and 1400 yards of yarn. It'll be really interesting to go back, see how much I lost in the washing between these two skeins and then to calculate my yardage and to see what I have. What has ended up happening, and I'll zoom the camera in so that you can see, so I don't have to sit here and hold it, is um, it's really, really fine. Um, it's come out as a, and I don't think I have a spinner's control card right here. I think I moved it around. But if you can see here, sort of typical woolen spun yarn, really, really nice twist angle, about 45 degrees. It's quite it's not super super elastic but it's 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 pretty good actually you know probably got probably got about seven 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 percent elasticity there it's probably about that and um lots of loft a little bit of inconsistencies from just the woolen nature of of the spinning and and spinning from pin drafted roving and spinning long draw and spinning quite quickly um i wasn't too too concerned about how perfect this yarn was um, I'm starting to find more and more with my spinning and with my making that I'm more concerned about the overall hand of the yarn and the overall feel of the yarn. I'm not quite so concerned with is this particular yard absolutely perfect or is it absolutely consistent. Um, what I really, really, really like is um, the lightness of this yarn. It's really, really light. I haven't, I haven't weighed it, but for the yardage that I got, the grist is going to be really quite high. And, uh, but the problem is it's quite fine. Um, it's a fingering weight. It might even be a light fingering. I think it's probably somewhere between 20 and 22 wraps per inch, which is quite fine. Um, you know, a little, it's even a little bit finer than sock yarn. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. I, what I will start with, however, is a knitted swatch and I'll see what the yarn looks like post, um, washing. So if I knit up the swatch, I'll do a few different needle sizes. I was even thinking about plugging in a lace pattern just to see what the yarn does when it's knit in lace. The uh, Poet that I knit last summer was done on 3.25 millimeter needles. I would have more than enough yardage for that sweater with this yarn. So that sparked my interest in terms of what I could maybe do in terms of another sweater pattern, Sari has a couple of, Sari Nordland designed that Poet cardigan and she's, sorry, Poet sweater. And there's a couple of sweaters that she's done that have that same aesthetic where you've got a lace panel all down the front. And there's a couple of other ones out there as well. There's a couple by Unit Toronto. Um, so U E W E Unit Toronto. Um, and there's the new one uh, that's coming out, the pair, Perry leaves that I desperately want to knit. But again, um, I'm not sure what the weight of yarn is. Knit on 3.25 millimeter needles, though, that might be perfect for uh, some of these for this yarn. So knit, swatch, sample, that's, we always end up coming back to that. And I'll go from there. These other two yarns are a little bit more interesting. And I'll just catch up really quickly with chat before we pivot a tiny bit. Um, Oh, Dij, Dion, um, I'm sorry to hear that. She had so shoulder surgery yesterday. I hope that you uh, heal up quickly. Um, let's see, just catching up on chat here. Diana says, that's what I was looking for. I make a center pull ball and then wind it into a plying ball. It's another step, but it really helps to mitigate snarls and bursts of twisty yarn coming out from the center. I love that idea, Diana. That's a great idea. I could totally do that with this yarn. That's perfect. And then it's more controlled because um, you're not trying to sit at the wheel and undo your, your center pull ball applying it onto the bobbin and sort of dealing with, with singles, even though my singles have been resting now for quite a number of weeks. Um, that would actually be a really, really great, um, idea, uh, to just do a, a plying ball. And then I wouldn't have any leftovers. I could ply it all up and then I could maximize my yardage. Dana, that's exactly what I was thinking actually was, um, for the little love cardigan. The only thing 
and I don't have it right here, is I actually bought yarn uh, at Fibers, uh, sorry, at Knit City for that cardigan specifically. And so I'm kind of holding out for that. And I'm planning, once I finish Yastava, I'm actually planning on starting that next. And it's yarn from Diz Darrow Ranch. And I just need to swatch it and uh, sort of get an idea of, of where I'm at with my gauge for that. So Perry Leaves is in DK. I think, I think you're right, Maggie. That's why I paused when I mentioned it. Cause yeah, I didn't think that it was in sort of a light sport fingering weight yarn. There are other, um, sweater patterns out there though. Um, oh, that's so funny, Hannah. I used to work at Unit in Toronto. Beautiful shop and the owner, Claudia is so talented. That's hilarious. I always, always make sure I go to Unit when we're, when I'm in Toronto. Um, uh, because of course we go back to Toronto quite, quite often because my husband's from Toronto. So our family is all still there. Yeah. Yeah. Cardigan by Hannah Fettig. That's a good idea too, Eve. Applying ball Kelly is where you take your singles and you wrap them into a ball together. Um, it's a technique that's used for uh, spindle spinning mostly actually. And, um, you, uh, wind off two, um, spindles, two or three spindles, four spindles, depending on what you're doing, um, at one time and you wind them into a ball. And actually the November content shows that it shows what applying ball looks like. Um, it is in the spinning pearls content because I spindle spun all of those yarns this month. So have a look in the PDF for a photo of what it looks like. <clears throat> and I think there's an explanation in there, but I can't remember. I, I might've just said that it was applying ball and not explained what applying ball was, but you'll see the photo and you'll understand. All right. So let's talk about these yarns cause they're kind of fun. So I've been working on them for quite a while. Um, they sort of got pushed to the back burner. I'll just tell you what they are first before I forget, because, um, inevitably I'll, you guys will ask and I'll not remember. So this one is organic Polworth. This is from Hello Yarn and it was in the colorway Spelt, which was a recent colorway. I feel like it was the colorway in July, but I might be wrong for their, for the fiber club. And, um, I spun this on my e-spinner. It is a three ply. Some of you may, may sort of be able to tell just from the, from the bar, the, the color twisting and the barber pulling that you can see in there a little bit. You may have assumed that it was a two, a three ply. And then for the other one, this is Itsy Bitsy Yarn Shop. Um, this is from Yukon, uh, White Horse Yukon. Uh, the shop owner is just lovely. It was nice to chat with her and she's been doing these dye experiments. And this is the, um, uh, her ultra fine baby alpaca. Yes, Hannah, things are a little bit dark today. I talked about it at the beginning of the show. Um, why? <laughs> um, I was kind of laughing at myself as to the reason. The, um, this ended up being a really interesting spin. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring the camera in for you so that you can see, um, sort of what, uh, some of the details of these two spins but they ended up being kind of fascinating. So this spin I threw onto my cromp scheme minstrel at the last minute. I sort of just needed something to spin. It's been in my stash for a really super long time. I was a little bit concerned because ultra alpaca, alpaca, uh, you know, baby alpaca, I've always been really, really super sensitive to it. And I've not really been able to work with it, which is why stuff like this, the Merino alpaca blend seems to sort of be that bridge for me to be able to work with alpaca at least a little bit. So I was a bit concerned about this because it was an ultra fine alpaca, ultra, ultra fine baby alpaca. It was just labeled as some of her dye experiments. And when I started to try to strip it down, it was quite badly fulled. Um, and I could have put it on the drum carter, opened it back up again, tried to spin it, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, oh, you know what's so funny, Eve? I couldn't turn the lights on during the credits because Nora was standing here yelling at me. So, you know, life, the, uh, <clears throat> so I couldn't strip it down. So I jumped onto the Kromp Kromsky anyways, onto the minstrel, ran it in double drive just because I really, really like double drive for long draw. And I sort of thought, well, if it's full and it's really badly, um, the fibers are just sort of, um, you know, compacted together. Um, I could just sort of draw the top out and spin it long draw and just spin it with speed and, and sort of use the, the motion of long draw to, to draw out those fibers. Um, and it'll be a really fine yarn. So that didn't work either. So I ended up defaulting to sort of a short forward sort of continuous back sort of 
I didn't really settle on one specific draft because depending on where in the fiber I was spinning, it was more or less compacted, sort of almost felted. And especially in the dark spots, so some of these darker areas uh, in the yarn where the, where the dark purpley blue was, that was really quite, quite bad. In the end though, I ended up with this really consistent, quite fine, almost lace fine yarn with a beautiful twist angle in the ply. Um, I put quite a bit of twist in, I counted my treadles all the way through so that it would be really, really consistent and very, very strong yarn. And it's soft and it's got this unbelievable drape. Just amazing, amazing drape. Like it's just, just incredible. It doesn't have any bounce or elasticity. There's no scales on alpaca, so it doesn't, it doesn't have any bounce. And because there's no wool in this, there's no, there's nothing to sort of help it to bounce or to, to return. There's no memory. Um, so that gives it that drape as well. And then there's, there's, there's this sheen on it. That's really quite lovely. And, uh, so I've been trying to catch up with Jane Stafford and I've been trying to catch up with her, um, you know, just some of the stuff that they've been working on in the community. I'm, I'm so severely behind. It's just not even funny. And I love how the colors came out. There's lots of places where the colors matched up. There's lots of places where there's some barber pulling as the colors transition. So some nice, long, slow transitions of color. And I just, you know what this is screaming to me, uh, a dented scarf. I have more than enough yardage to do sort of a two and a half yard warp. Um, it wouldn't have to be very wide. It could be sort of between 12 and 15 inches wide on the loom, which would really come in nicely to just a, you know, a, 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 a sort of a scarf shawl kind of an idea. And because when you cram and dent, so with this, if it was a dented scarf with the denting, you have gaps. So do you guys know what denting is? Cause I can go back a step and I can explain what denting is. Um, but basically with a dent, with the denting and because there would be like literally holes in the weaving, uh, it would just be a wonderful way to showcase the yarn and utilize the yarn, set it at what it's meant to be set at. So I, th I suspect this needs to be set at somewhere between 16 and 18 in, um, ends per inch. And then weave um, a dented scarf and I, the drape would be unbelievable. So I'm kind of leaning toward, toward a dented scarf. So um, before we move on, just very briefly, because I'm sure there are people out there that don't know what denting is. Basically, denting leaves holes. So when you're pulling, when you're slaying your reed, whether you're on a table loom or a rigid heddle or a floor loom, it doesn't matter. As you're warping, um, you've wound your warp on however you do that. And then for a table loom or a floor loom, you've threaded your heddles, but then on a rigid heddle or on a floor loom or a table loom, when you go to slay, when you go to thread your heddle, uh, uh, slay your reed. So on the rigid heddle, that's the same step. Okay. Um, you literally leave gaps. So when you go to tie on, whether you tie on or lash on, you've got gaps in your reed all the way across. And when you go to do your weaving, you match that in your picks per inch so that you literally have like holes. What ends up happening in the end, crammed and spaced, that's right, Zan. Uh, Zan. So what ends up happening in the washing is it all kind of comes in on itself and um, you know those threads move and it creates these areas that are more sheer and then other areas that are a little bit more opaque and it just creates the most beautiful um, aesthetic. Uh, it's very aesthetically pleasing and Jane does a one scarf on with some silk and it just, you can tell, uh, you, you know, she kind of compares the cotton with the silk as the warp, sorry, as the weft and as she's weaving and you can see sort of the differences and just how truly luxurious it looks. It's really beautiful. So that is my plan with this. I have no idea when it will go on the loom. I'm actually planning to throw it onto the Jane. Um, onto my table loom because that would just be absolutely perfect um, to have a little project going on there uh, because the Jane is living in our schoolroom 
and uh, sometimes the kids just need me there they don't necessarily need me hovering or they don't need me like right over their shoulders but they definitely need me aware and 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 sort of nearby so I, I don't I'm not gonna stash that I need to get photos of it and then I will um, hopefully get a warp wound I just need to actually figure out the other thing I need to figure out is uh, how much yardage I actually have post finishing and then I need to do some math do some working backwards how long can I make the warp based on what I need for the weft this came out beautifully the last few yards and it ended up probably being about 20 yards or so I ended up chain plying which I actually really really liked um, I thought it was very very effective although I wasn't I didn't regret not doing the three ply I, I love three ply yarns I love the effect of three ply yarns I think I, I really like that barber pulling this is so analogous there is so much much depth and movement it is very very pleasing to the eye again this came out as a light fingering it's a it's like I said it's a three ply but you can just see how pleasing all of those colors are and and just the twisting and the barber pulling and I just love it part of why I really like these yarns that are spun like this and where the colors are all that where they all are sort of put together is when it's analogous like this and it's from just one area of the color wheel um, you know, these are all grays, browns, and okra yellows. Um, so it's all from like that one area. This almost kind of gives it like an overall orange appearance, sort of a burnt pumpkin-y orange. Um, it, it's for me, it's, it just sings. Like the, to, to me, this yarn is, is like the epitome of why I started spinning in the first place. Uh, it's a one-off skein. Amanda and I actually, who's in the chat today, we had a really interesting conversation earlier this week about to what we record and what we don't record and it's something that I really struggle with because sometimes um, I feel like I'm over recording because I'm sort of making sure everything's written down to share with you guys on the podcast but you're not going to spin this yarn I'm not going to spin this yarn again same with this so why write it all down and um, so I've been trying to be a little bit more intentional about so what I do write and what I don't write down with something like this that now that I've got the finished project or the finished yarn and I want to go on and weave with it I probably will make some notes about it and have a little bit more of a formal write up about it have a record of the finished yarn um, so that I can sort of document what the yarn was like but I'll never have a hundred gram you know bit of that particular fiber that was dyed in that particular way by that particular person that was treated the the fiber was sort of treated in that specific way like I'll never have that again and as my experiments my experiments become more and more controlled and I start working from that original sort of fiber and then work my way all the way through from the dyeing to the spinning to the weaving or the dyeing the spinning to the knitting it makes sense to me that I would start to document more and more of that process so that I can start to recreate it but with something like this or something like this I'm not going to have it ever again so working through to a finished project is really great but it's a one-off and um, so I'm started I've started to write down more of sort of overarching ideas and sort of um, I've started keeping it's it's just very new in its creation very new in its sort of um, it's in its infancy the idea of more of a visual journal where I would actually take parts of my yarns and put them into the journal just to sort of fuel my creativity more so than documenting everything and feeling like I have to write everything down and all of the finished measurements and all the finished things and all of that kind of stuff so I would love to hear from you guys what are some of the things that you have been thinking about in terms of documentation what works for you I'm finding that more and more I'm becoming more interested in the in documenting my creative process and that actually has becoming is becoming more and more uh, important for me personally um, the other thing that I want to say about this yarn it's organic pull worth um, it doesn't have as much stretch as I thought that it maybe would in the finished yarn but I did hard ply it so it's plied quite hard and this was spun on my e-spinner and I do find that when I spin my yarns on the e-spinner because of the speed and the way that I'm drafting this was drafted very finely to give me such a fine finished yarn I do lose some of that elasticity because it's just the singles are a bit harder spun and then it's plied quite tightly because you can see that that twist angle is is quite severe and uh, it, it gives it's it's going to wear really super well 
but what that sort of does on the back end is you lose some of your elasticity and some of your, it's not totally gone, but it's maybe not as marked as it would have been if it was a really light, fluffy yarn that was spun um, with a little bit less twist in the singles and then not plied quite so hard. But for what I wanted and for the type of yarn that I wanted to create, this is what I was hoping for. So really, really happy. And I'm looking forward to, I actually have another four ounces in my stash that's also dyed by Adrian of Hello Yarn. And I actually am thinking that I'm going to pull that out. I'm going to, I'm, I'm thinking about spinning that next so that I can actually put the two together. They would coordinate beautifully and it would give me just a little bit more yardage, but I don't know what I'm going to do with them. So who knows? That's the problem with some of these one-off skeins is that I, I don't know what to do with them once they're spun. I don't really want any more sweaters. Um, I'm kind of getting a bit sweatered out. I have two or three that I really want to make, but other than that, I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy on the sweater front for a little bit. And I just want to work on some other things, which I think many of you can probably really appreciate. I like to document how I split the braid, whether it's a fractal lining up the color, etc. says Dana. Yeah, it's funny you would say that because actually Dana, that's something that I often like to document. And I found that those are some of the notes that go into my Ravelry notebook about my hand spun yarns because I don't necessarily need it like written down anywhere, but then I can refer back on Ravelry later if I'm wondering what to do and what I did and what my thought process was. But my notes on, on um, Ravelry do tend to be quite sparse. So I, I'm torn about I'm torn about maybe eventually, um, you know, sort of amping that up a little bit. Throw them all together in a weave. Yeah, maybe Kelly. Yeah, maybe. Um, it's it it would it would definitely uh, stand up to weaving because of the um, nature of just the slightly harder spun. Don't really want to make socks, so um, it kind of left me thinking and wondering. But I don't have to make a decision right now. I can definitely stash it for a bit. But I do have a big yarn stash. All right, let's talk about this. This is the Cat Bells cardigan. This is the front left side for those who are kind of looking at it and kind of wondering what it is that I'm showing you. It's a little bit challenging. I'm gonna have to move this yarn, I think. I don't really wanna throw it on the floor, but I don't really have anywhere else to put it. So onto the floor it goes. So this is the front left of the cardigan. It's long, that's part of the problem. It's a little bit difficult to show you and I don't really wanna show you on my dress form because I wanna show you the a little bit closer up what the issue is and what, what I'm struggling with. So I'm gonna zoom the camera in even a little bit more. So this is the pocket and you seam the pockets on after. So you've actually knit your the body of the cardigan and you've, you've bound off and now you've got the pocket to throw on and you measure up from the bottom hem a certain amount and then you measure over a certain amount. And uh, let me tell you, these are really, really hard to sew on. I am a, I would consider myself an advanced knitter. Um, I've been knitting for pretty much my whole life um, and very, very intensely through my adult life since I was about 24. And I, I'm struggling with this. This has not been very easy. Um, and so I, I welcome any kind of ideas and any kind of sort of, um, thoughts about it. You know, Eve, before I go on to this, that's actually a really interesting uh, comment. What about reviving the blog? So that's actually been something that I've been thinking about, um, more for myself than for anyone else. Um, I really miss, I've mentioned it on the podcast a few times. I really miss people blogging and, um, I miss reading them. I miss reading about people's creative process. I think a lot of people share their stuff on Instagram now, which is fine. But if you're not on Instagram, um, it's, it's difficult and Instagram really only shows you what it thinks that you want to see in the algorithm. It like creates it. So it ends up kind of being in this echo chamber. And, uh, so I find that I have to search for people and I have to seek out people, but it's difficult to find new people. Um, and, uh, I'm really, really fascinated right now. And I don't think that this is going to stop with sort of how people's creativity is coming out in their making and what it is that they're doing with their creativity. It's one thing to begin to study 
and to look at uh, a specific topic. Like maybe you're going to do your Ontario Hand Weavers and Spinners Master Weaver unit just on tapestry and you're just going to do that because that's really what you want to focus on and that's what you want to do. Um, or you're going to look at a few of them because you really want to do rugs or whatever. And that becomes an area of study for that specific period of time. But then how do you, but then what is your creative process in those things that you make post? Like I really just kind of want to make things <laughs> and uh, I want to feel inspired by my projects and I want to feel like what I'm doing matters. And I think that that's the age old question, right? My mom and I talk about it all the time as, as my mom being an artist herself. And we went to Circle Craft here in Vancouver. It's over this weekend and it ends tomorrow. It started on Wednesday and it's a big market that goes on every every year at this time. It's always on this weekend. And I was surprised how busy it was. I, I was really surprised. You had to show proof of vaccination to get in and then you had to wear a mask the whole time. But there were a lot of people. And I know at one point my mom and I were both like, oh my goodness, like this is just too much. And we kind of, we moved over to another area that was a bit quieter. But it's very food heavy now and it's very jewelry heavy now. And so Nora had a blast looking at everything. But I was really interested in the fact that there aren't that many people that are at that, that because it's a juried show to get into. There aren't that many people now that are coming into a show like that that are doing, there's barely any fiber arts anymore. There's basically none. So there's, there's textiles in terms of a couple of people that are doing fashion. But even then, they're not doing the reconstructed clothing that they used to do. There's not a lot of upcycling anymore. Um, there were used to be a few weavers that would be there. They're all gone. Um, and that was even before COVID. This isn't, this isn't just sort of as a result of, of there not being a show last year. But I'm just really curious and really interested um, in what would be helpful in terms of sharing a creative process. What are people looking for that would be helpful? Maggie says she misses blogs too. And... Um, like even like, you know, Google Reader, you know, they got rid of it. And, you know, Feedly is okay, but there's not any really great blog readers anymore. And I think part of the reason is because people aren't reading them. So, yeah. It's called Circle Craft, uh, Josie, and it's at um, the Vancouver Convention Center. It's right down at Canada Place. It's phenomenal. Like if you, if your friend can go, if she's in Vancouver, he or she is in Vancouver this weekend, uh, definitely tell them to, to check it out. It's phenomenal. Anyways, I am having with my Cat Bells cardigan, a really challenging time seaming this on because the problem is, is that you've got your seaming on to garter stitch. So trying to get a straight line, this all, I have to take this side of the pocket. I actually have to unpick it. You can tell I just left my needle cause I just had had enough. I have to unpick this whole side and move it down a little bit. And then you, I need to create a line across here. I started off by trying to seam the bottom and then the sides, but that actually was quite difficult because you, ju I just needed one side tagged down. And then I thought, well, I'll do the other side, but it ended up not being completely straight across. So it needs to just move down, but you can see it's just unbelievably fiddly. However, it's worth it. So at one point I was like, I'm just throwing this all out. I'm not going to do it. No pockets, blah, blah, blah. However, part of the, the charm of this cardigan is the pockets. So if I throw it on over top of Yastava for a minute, when you have it on, the thing is, is that the pocket finishes it. I, I didn't do a very good job throwing it on. It doesn't look very good, but just go with me. Uh, it, it just, yeah, it really finishes the cardigan really nicely and it looks more finished with the pocket. I think it just ties it all together with the stockinette sleeves. So everything else is done. All of the ends are, 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 um, are woven in and other than where the pockets are obviously. And, um, it's done. It's just, it's just these plain pockets. So yeah, difficult, very difficult. This is a pattern by Megan Nodecker. I would highly recommend it if you're looking for something just really simple that you want to throw on kind of, um, boxy, you know, uh, very, very pleasing knit. It was, it's just been really simple and really easy. Uh, and the, uh, garter, uh, lace pattern, super easy to memorize. I did baste it, uh, Diane, that's part of the problem. That's why I'm so frustrated. <laughs> 
the garter just moves and it's just fiddly, 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 fiddly. I just need to sit down. I think I needed to take a break and I just need to sit down and do it again. You know what I mean? I, I finally remembered to grab a tag. So the tag is here. It is called Homegrown from Casa Embra because that's my friend Anne. It is her 100% Langley Wool CVM Merino Romney Cross. It's a three ply DK weight. Uh, 288 meters per 113 grams. So it's a four, it's a full four ounce skein that you're, that you're purchasing. So that is the yarn. I finally remembered. Uh, can you show us the back of your shawl that you are wearing? The, the, the whole thing, um, Sam, hopefully you guys can see that there. So I dyed this with logwood. And it was a, uh, 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 colored, um, oh, uh, like a dark brownie, um, like a gray natural colored Merino alpaca. Um, it was a 50, 50, it was from Kramer yarns. Uh, they're a mill and a, I think they do yarns now too. Um, and you, like I said, you, you knit it from the bottom, from the bottom. So it gets wider and wider and wider. And then you finish off with your garter, um, border at the top, but then you go back and you add on the garter that goes down to the point. So you do that after the fact. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. Um, you know what? The other thing is it's incredibly warm. It's perfect. I was wearing it at circle craft the other day and I just felt I wear it. Normally I would wear it like this. I just wanted something on my shoulders today cause it's a little bit too warm for a cardigan, but I needed something. Normally I would wear it like this, but when I'm podcasting, it gets in my way. When I wear, when I wear shawls and stuff, when I'm podcasting and it's around my neck like this, I feel like I can't move. <laughs> I feel like I'm stuck. So I normally don't wear it like this when I'm podcasting. I very rarely wear shawls when I'm podcasting. I'm sure you guys have noticed. Um, but this is how I would normally wear it. And I was also wearing my Albini, uh, cardigan that was my hand spun. So yeah, but that's it there. Thank you, you guys. That's very kind. So Eustava, I don't know what happened. I have no idea, but all of a sudden I had enough waffle knit that I was on the ribbing. I sort of stopped yesterday and I was like, I better measure the body. Like I've been working on this for a long time. I'm sure it's only like 10 or 10 or 11 inches. Cause it just felt like when I was up here, it just felt like I was not getting anywhere. And it went, it hibernated for a little bit. And uh, I just sort of thought, oh, I'll just start knitting on it. And I'll just work on it a little bit. And I, I won't worry about how much I'm getting done on the body. I won't measure it. I'll just, I'll just keep knitting. So then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I bet I better measure it. I'm probably getting to like 10 inches and then I ne only need to do three or four inches more. So I just probably need to know I was already at 13 inches. So I was way down here. I did lengthen the cardigan. So the cardigan length should only be about to here. It's a little bit shorter than what I prefer and what I like. Um, so the cardigan, uh, you knit your, the waffle to about 11 inches and then two inches of ribbing. And I knit mine to 13, almost 14 inches. Actually, it was like 13.75 by the, when I caught it and I measured it and I was like, Oh shoot, I still had to finish that particular repeat. So it's probably about 14 inches and then the two inches of twisted rib at the bottom. So very, very effective. Um, really, really lovely. Um, I'm, I really, really like the, um, the look of the waffle. Um, I did make a mistake. You can see it on the monitor. There's a mistake in here. Um, it's just off by one stitch, but then it worked, but then I fixed it. I didn't go back and fix that one row. Uh, it's funny how on computer monitors you can see mistakes. If you're ever wondering if there's mistakes in your weaving, hold it up and take a photo, uh, digitally because the camera will pick it up. Um, because it doesn't travel, it doesn't pick up the light the same way. Whereas when you're just looking at it, like when I'm looking at it here, I, I can't tell. So, uh, yeah, kind of a tip if you're looking for skips and you're looking for mistakes in your weaving and your knitting, uh, take a, to hold it up in the light so that the light can go through and take a photo. So I need to pick up and do the, uh, collar and I need to do the button bands. And then of course I need to do the sleeves, but we'll, we'll get there. This is just when I can work on it. This is out of Estelle natural, uh, llama natural worsted. This was, I had started this because I had the yarn in my stash 
and it was part of the camel lid study that we did in the summer. I thought, I wonder what it's like to work with a commercial yarn that has llama in it. I happen to have this in my stash from years ago. Um, and it is a 20% llama, 80% merino. So we'll see what it'll be like. I think it's going to grow. Um, when I did my swatch, it grew quite a bit. Um, but in the waffle, it seems to be holding its shape quite well. But I'm not convinced that this isn't going to grow quite a bit when I wash it. Uh, the pattern for the shawl, I actually linked Priscilla up top. Let me see if I still have it here. I'll link it again. It's Hyssop by Layla Raven. And she wrote a book. It's from a book. Um, oh, thank you, Charlotte. So she put a couple of pocket suggestions a couple of minutes back. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I will go back and have a look. Seaming the bottom of the pocket, pocket maybe skewer stitches from the body into thin onto thin dpns to audition and count before sewing the pocket stitches that's actually not a bad idea one at a time yeah i've been doing that releasing them one at a time as i sew i did block the i great question Brittany. i did uh block the cardigan uh before adding the pockets and actually i did lightly block the pockets too so everything should be like, that's why everything should line up quite nicely. But, um, yeah. What if the, what if you finished without the pockets and let the cardigan settle? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Brittany. Cause that's, that is something actually, if, if for those who are not, um, seasoned knitters, the, uh, when you're trying to seam, if you're having trouble, definitely block or give things a light steam with an iron. Um, just give yourself as much sort of, you know, prep as you can and have it as close to whatever the finished item is going to be as possible. Seeming on unblocked things are really, really difficult. So yeah, <laughs> Lisa, the camera maybe doesn't complete, complete the pattern the way your brain wants it to. I think so. I think that's actually it. Yeah. Yeah. All good Priscilla. Yeah. All good. So because of the time, let's go into community participation. Let me just cue it all up here and I will see you guys on the other side. We've got Kelly first for breeding color study. She shared um, her Jacob. I just love these shawls. This one in particular, I just, that one is, um, the first one is actually West Coast color. It's not breeding color, but this is breeding color. I just thought this was unbelievable. Look at that gradient in there. And this one was from our other study. I just love this as well. So um, that was Splashes of Joy. Um, this isn't breeding color, this, this last one. So let's start off with this one. I finally photographed my finished shawls for the year so far. Uh, the first one is the West Coast Color Falkland in Active Pass, knit into the Age of Brass and Steam shawl. The second one, which was the Crafty Jack's uh, Jacob Breed Study that just went by, is the Pine Lake shawl. And then the second one, the one that just went through that's the Splashes of Joy, is an Easy Peasy uh, Bandana. And she's linked all of the patterns in the show notes. So for those who didn't see the show notes yet this week, um, there is the link and they're, they're all linked in the show notes. So all three of them, I just think they are fantastic. This one would be so easy to just throw on like I'm wearing this right now. You just throw it on for a splash of color. You know, if you're wearing um, a plain shirt like what I'm wearing right now or something gray or white just something and you need to just spruce it up a little bit That would just be perfect and she actually showed me the West Coast color one the Falkland one in person at our artisan sale last week It is absolutely beautiful her spinning and her knitting is just amazing in real life Gorgeous Kelly really well done so this is from Ange, spindle spun stitches. So spindle spun summer has kind of morphed into spindle spun stitches. And I haven't really had a chance to talk about it very much because honestly, it's just been kind of a crazy, crazy fall. So I think what we'll do is if you guys just continue to share all of your spindle spinning, all of your projects that you're making with your spindle spun yarns, and then we'll resurrect and kind of get, get a, a, a make along going in the new year. 
uh, that's specifically sort of geared towards those who are spinning, knitting, and weaving with their spindle spun yarns. So this is her, this is An Ange's um, Astra Cowl. Ange was on Woolen Spinning Radio this month for those who would like to check it out. The conversation, um, that's for patrons, the Woolen Spinning Radio. It's the audio podcast, the sort of, there is usually a video um, because we record on Zoom now. Um, so it's linked in the in the show notes, like in the actual Woolen Spinning Radio post, if you would prefer to watch them that way. And I have put together a playlist for all of the Woolen Spinning Radio episodes. I just have to put it into the show notes. I haven't I haven't quite gotten gotten to that point yet. Just trying to get everything organized on the back end. But um, my conversation with Ange was just wonderful. And so she finished her Astra Cowl knit in the Manx Lochton and Manx Blend yarns that she spindle spun in the summer. I love this. I really love how this project turned out. The pattern was really addictive. Some of the dyed yarns were very close in tone to the natural brown, so they don't show up quite as much in the finished cowls as the brighter colors, but I don't mind that at all. I actually really like this. I like that that very natural, neutral um, color work. And I got that in my Kiviet Merino hand spun mitts. That was that very low contrast color work. And I have to admit, I go to them all the time. I love them. <laughs> As a side note, you can probably see by the photos, it turns out that it's not so easy to take a selfie and show off your cowl. I don't know, Ange, I think you did a great job. This is from Laura for uh, Zero to Hero. I love this so much, Laura. It just, oh, as soon as I saw it, I just thought, oh, I literally had that reaction. Uh, so this is Zero to Hero. This is all things sort of going from, from fiber, whether it's comb top or uh, your raw fleece or whatever, through to a finished item, whether it's woven, crocheted, knit, or anything else you can do with yarn. So this is her shifty cardigan is finally finished. She started with white and gray fin wool top last winter. She dyed and spun them and here's the results. She has to say she's really pleased and quite proud of herself as she started spinning on a wheel only a year ago. This is a year of spinning, int being intentional about her learning and working her way through to uh, being able to spin for, for a sweater. I just think it's fantastic. The sunny photos were taken in Berlin, my first trip abroad after the pandemic started. I hope you had a great trip, Laura, and that's just beautiful. Well done. This is another Zero to Hero from Rebecca. Um, the chat is just going crazy with amazing and love it and fabulous. And yeah, you guys are so kind and so uh, such great cheerleaders. Uh, so this is from Rebecca. This is actually taken in their place in Rankin Inlet in Nunavut. I was browsing this thread this morning. So this is the Zero to Hero thread and realized that something was missing and that I never finished up. I never uploaded my finished, um, my photos of my finished Zero to Hero. I finished it a few days before our long trip this summer. So I didn't even photograph it until the fall. It's inspired by the Comfort Fade Cardi, but the pattern I used was the Grayling cardigan from an old interweave knits. This was the final use of fiber that I bought 10 years ago when I first started spinning and was a little over ambitious about how much I would be spinning. I wrote about the personal significance of the sweater on my blog and that's linked in the show notes, the link to the blog post. Beautiful, Rebecca, absolutely beautiful, I love this. And the Comfort Fade Cardi is a pattern by Andrea Mowry. This is from Maria. Another Zero to Hero project this year was this blanket. The brown yarn is from a fin fleece. The oatmeal yellow and orange were spun from a big bat from an organic farm. It is fin also. I spun it long draw. The little stripes with variegated green yarn is dyed by an indie dyer. And um, I, I'm not even gonna try to say her name. Tulia, Tulia Sam, Sam, Samella. I'll throw it in the chat. You guys can, then you can look her up. It's Falkland Merino and it worked well. My weaving experience is not very big, but I think now how this turned, but I like how this turned out and do not look too closely. I think it's fantastic, Maria. Beautiful work. Absolutely gorgeous. And I like that you left a big fringe. Um, I think sometimes we cut our fringes really, really close and really tight, but I like that you knotted it and left it really, really long. This is from Jenny. This just makes everything that I do worth it. So this is Jenny's. 
nearing her first, her one year Patreon anniversary. And so she took stock of the yarn I've spun over this time in my experience. It's amazing to see the growth from the first tightly spun skein to the fluffy, relaxed gray yarn in the middle. So much community, creativity, and joy in this making. I'm ever so grateful for the friendships I've made, love you all, and for reaching some of my big goals. Thank you, Rachel. A visual reminder to just keep going. It's all yarn, it's all beautiful, and play is the secret sauce of life. Cheers to another exciting years, friend. Yarns, I made yarn, woohoo. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny, for those kind words. And uh, I think you guys all should give yourselves a pat on the back because many of you were influential in her spinning and her making and the fact that there is this big pile of yarn here. So well done to you guys too for just supporting one another. This last one is from J uh, Suzanne. Uh, I have been wanting to make the shift cowl for a while. I finally dug out up a couple of braids from my stash and added a third, two Malabrigo noobs and one hip strings pullwear silk flax. Um, to spin to spin the yarn. I enjoyed every aspect of making this cowl from choosing the color, spinning the yarn, to knitting it, and I will wear it often. It looks amazing on you, Suzanne. I have to admit, I thought I would wear my shift cowl all the time, but maybe it's because of COVID and we've been home so much that I haven't pulled it out as much as I had hoped. Um, and so that is something, I, I love that project. I love how it turned out. And I'm bummed that I haven't sort of been able to wear it as, more than I, than I thought. So Jenny said it in her post, and I think this is really important. This is, comes to sort of the section of the show where we look at sample spinning and play. The creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct. That's from Carl Jung. So this is from Kelly. So my first fiber to yarn transformation is complete. 100% hand-painted Targi top bought on Etsy on a homemade kicks, sorry, on a homemade kick spindle. My next step is getting more and doing it again. Only this time I'll try and pay attention to getting my singles more consistent. Oh my goodness, Kelly, who cares? I think this is fantastic. You just made yarn on a kick spindle. That's amazing. Well done. I love the colors. This is from Sarah. Wow, lovely makes, ladies. Love them all, says Sam. This is from Sarah. I finished my Halloween hand spun socks. I did not get them done in time for Halloween, but better late than never. I love how they turned out, and plus, I have enough yarn left over to make another pair. That's amazing. Well done, Sarah. This is from Laura Line. She finished her mitts, her Halloween mitts. So um, she shared the yarn earlier. She finished her Halloween fingerless mitts just in time. So happy with them. The garter bands fold to cover the fingers. The pattern is the lambing mitts by Ver uh, Veronica Job. And I added a picture of the original bat too and that was from Urso Yarn Company. Yeah, really fun. I really like when I see bats like this where there's the natural fiber, the natural color mixed in as well. But you guys know how much I love natural shades. Anything in natural shades, I'm sold. This is from Josie. I am working my way on my pie blend sampler kit from Inglewood, Inglenook Fibers and Play, sorry, uh, I'm going to start again. I am working my way on my pie blend sampler kit from Ingle Nook Fibers and today, perfect timing, I got to spin the pumpkin pie sample. I think that was for Canadian Thanksgiving. So that was uh, three weekends ago? Was that three weekends ago was Canadian Thanksgiving now or was it a full month? I guess it's a full month this weekend actually. Yeah, because Canadian Thanksgiving was the weekend of the 11th of October. And finally, some weaving. This is from Kathy. This is sort of a zero to hero. It was a battle over a year and a half. So sorry about the long winged saga. I started with one of my two fleeces, Wensleydale. Before I learned from your good advice, I tried an internet tip of doing the initial wash by spraying it down with cold water from a hose. Lesson one, don't trust anything you get from the internet. You can stop gasping now. <laughs> Lesson number two, washing wool with Dawn requires hot water to get rid of the lanolin. Lesson number three, Combing with lanolin is hard. Lesson four, try not to weave the full width of the loom. I had tension issues with extra heddles getting in the way. <coughs> Sorry, you guys. From the spacer sticks on the warp beam, not quite going all the way across, using 
multiple warp chains and from varying elasticity from the yarn itself. Because the fabric was fairly open, I wanted to fold the blanket a bit back to lesson one. I put it in my washer with wool wash. I stopped it four minutes in, but that was enough to completely mat the fringe. So I was back to pulling the fibers apart one last time. Lesson five, I will never again use my washer to finish handmade wool items. All was not lost though. Fixing the fringe, fringe left it curly, which I find oddly pleasing. And the fiber really just wanted to turn to return to its lock form. See the photo I didn't spin, I, sp I didn't spin it like that. Uh, and besides the curly fringe, the main fabric got a boucle like look, although I also very much liked the pre-fold look, sigh. I get it, Kathy. I have had projects like this, I've shared them on the podcast that kind of just ended up being out wah wah. However, you're finished blanket is absolutely beautiful. Those yarns are amazing and you learned so much and you took the time to share it with the community. So thank you so much. A lot of this stuff, I think, I think what happens oftentimes is, you know, we kind of go to the internet thinking that, you know, we'll get sound and good advice. And, you know, I think unfortunately that's just not always the case. And, uh, you were lucky that you were working with a wool like Wensleydale where you get that just really neat, really cool, um, effect afterwards and that you took the time to share with us. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I love the sunrise colors as well. Yeah. Um, these projects are all amazing. You guys, you are all so inspirational. I totally and completely agree. And thank you for sharing the, the projects that don't necessarily always go a hundred percent according to plan. They're still beautiful and they're still amazing. And it's really great to be able to share them. So I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for being here, you guys, and, and for t taking some time out of your Saturday to spend it with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. And to those who are celebrating American Thanksgiving, I hope that you have a really wonderful time just cozying in and cozying down. I know for a lot of my friends that um, are American, it's something that they really look forward to every year. So I hope that uh, that's the case for you. Same time, same place next week. And uh, I will see you guys then. This week we actually have a couple of things going on. Um, we've got the wool circle for those who are subscribers to that live stream on Tuesday morning. I wanted to quickly put a plug in um, about the wool circle. That will, the time unfortunately will be changing again. I'm really sorry. It won't change for this month. It will stay because we have one more this month, but either in December or January, it will be changing in terms of the time. So um, if you guys have a suggestion about where you would like to see it, I have a couple of ideas what, of what I think will work for me. But if you guys have some ideas, I would love to hear, but it does have to move. Um, and then the other thing we have coming up is, um, what, what do we have coming up? There was a couple of things I wanted to mention and now I can't remember. Hmm. Um, book club this coming Friday. We've got Q and A next weekend for those who are uh, part of the Q and A sessions. Um, I think there may or may not be a spot available for queries and explorations right now. I can't remember. Um, so if you're interested in queries and explorations, have a look. I, I feel like there's a spot available, but I might be wrong. Uh, so I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but, um, our maker morning, we will have one again happening in a couple, it's next week. So again, that time will be changing as well. I have to pull everything off of 6:30 in the morning. Um, there's a reason that I can't talk about just yet. It has nothing to do with the show or the podcast or anything that I'm doing. It affects other people in my household. Um, but the 6:30 time slot is gonna it isn't going to be available anymore. So I'm going to have to move that around as well. So for Maker Morning, I would love to hear from you guys times that would work for you as well. So that would be really helpful. Um, Kelly says, I'd like it during school hours. I hear you. Um, I only have Mondays and Tuesdays for school hours, but if, if a Monday or a Tuesday works for you guys, we can absolutely put it, some of this stuff back at noon on Monday or Tuesday, just like we used to. Cause we used to podcast at uh, 12 noon on Wednesday afternoons. So that was our time, uh, Pacific. So yeah, let me know. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I hope that you are full, surrounded by fibery goodness and doing lots of stuff. And I hope that um, you guys are really good and doing lots and dreaming and exploring your creativity. So 
See you next week. Bye, guys.